This program is brought to you by Emory University. Today's presentation is entitled, Are All of Our Foster Care Providers Really Part of Team Permanency? And we've compiled quite an extensive panel that will bring a lot of different perspectives to that question about the role of providers in achieving permanency for children in our child welfare system. Uh, and specifically, many of them will talk from their experiences with the Cold Case Project, and I expect that they'll give you more detail about their role in that and what that project does if you're not familiar. Uh, just by way of quick introduction, I'll ask them maybe to raise their hand as I call them out. We're just going to quick introduction, and then I'll refer you also to the bios which have been included in the materials for additional background on the experiences and credentials of all of our folks here. Uh, so if you don't mind, Kate Cantrell is with us here in the front row. Kate Cantrell is the director of the Georgia and Alabama programs of Youth Villages, Ursula Davis, who is the System of Care Unit Director with the Division of Family and Children's Services here in the state, Jessica Parks who's a foster parent, and I know you're going to enjoy hearing from her. Heather Rouse, who is the executive director of the Multi-Agency Alliance for Children. Ashley Wilcott, who is a special assistant attorney general, that is an attorney who represents the department in these proceedings, and the lead attorney for the Cold Case Project. And Diane Yearby, who is the, um, with the office of, she's the director, excuse me, of the Office of Provider Management with the Division of Family and Children's Services. So again, much more information is provided for you in the materials, but for the sake of brevity, I will ask um, up Ashley, who will kick off our presentation today. Please join me in welcoming them. Thank you for having us all here today. I know we all enjoy talking about what we do. I feel very fortunate to be in child welfare arena doing anything. Just briefly about myself, I do represent DFACS as an attorney in three different counties. I also have had the uh, privilege of being the Cold Case Project lead for three years. We're going on our third year and have learned a lot and have really enjoyed that opportunity and working with other individuals here to present to you today. One of the things that I'd like to just jump right into this in the interest of time is to talk a little bit about one of the main goals of today's training academy. And that is how can you be a better advocate for a child who is in congregate care? And this is a question that we all need to think about whether you serve as an attorney, a social worker, a state representative, whatever your role is in child welfare, you need to think about this question carefully. The cold case project, we have the other items, let me just mention on the agenda, the other items are going to be addressed by each speaker. My goal is to give you just a brief overview of the Georgia cold case project and an introduction to one particular child who's been reviewed during the project and the current status that Jessica will share with you. Um, the first slide, I'm just going to point out the last sentence. Ashley Rhodes is a um, an, an adult now who was in foster care as a child and she wrote a book. I saw her speak at one of our seminars for SAGS and she was incredible, an incredible speaker. And one of the things that um, she says on here that she stated at one of her speeches was, it is not only what we do, but also what we do not do for which we are accountable. And so we would just suggest that you think about those things, whatever your role is in terms of what can you do for these children. And it's not, congregate care is a word that I've learned through the project, but often if I'm in court, it's, it's inpatient or it's residential treatment for children. That's how often it's referred to, but that's what we're talking about during today's presentation. The Cold Case Project is a project that was started by the AOC, Administrative Offices of the Court, Supreme Court, project initiative. It's done in conjunction with state DFACS and it started three years ago. We're on our third year this year, 2012. And Michelle Barkley, this was her vision and she's really seen it come to fruition and put it together and put her time and energy and had an idea to hire attorneys who are in the child welfare arena, whether they're attorneys for parents, attorneys for children, attorneys for the department, and hired 11 individuals who then worked on this project. What are cold cases? 
I know she's talked about in some of her presentations, it sounds like the TV show, which it is not. It are, they are cases that were identified by a predictive model. Andy Barkley is a statistician, and he put this together to find the coldest cases, the cases that are lingering, the children that are in foster care and are not achieving permanency. And he used a number of different predictive factors to determine which are the coldest cases in the state of Georgia. And the goal was then to look at those specific cases and identify what are the barriers, what are the reasons that these particular children in the state of Georgia are remaining in foster care without permanency, without a permanent home. And two different outcomes as a result of the first year of the project. The first, the first year really was to identify and work on not only the specific cases, but also to look at the overall trends and find out what are the different big picture items, issues that need to be addressed by individuals involved in child welfare. And the second was to look at the individual cases and see what can we do for those particular children. But what we found were there were very specific trends and we identified those in a report and those trends were easy to find. It was a little surprising to me. I thought, okay, we have all these children. There are gonna be many, many, many different reasons, right, while they're still in care. It was not that difficult to find. There were very specific limited trends overall, and one of the big ones was institutional care. Many of these children were in long-term residential placements, institutional care, and I cannot tell you how many times, Leslie Stewart and Rachel Davidson are both fellows from the first year of the project, still involved with the project, and I can't tell you how many times we sat around the table and discussed how documented it was that this was because of the children's behaviors. And honestly, there was some language that would even go as far as to say, and Pat's here too, I'm sorry, Pat, I just realized you'd come in. She was another of the fellows, to say, it's the children's fault. It's their fault, it's their behaviors. Yes, they may have behaviors that need specialized treatment, specific services. Does that mean it's their fault? No, does it mean they need services? Yes. Does it mean that institutional care is best for those particular children? Maybe, maybe not. The specific case you're gonna hear about today is an example of what can happen once a child gets into congregate care. There are a lot of positives and good reasons for congregate care. This is not to say it's a bad thing. This is to say that you have to look at so many different factors. And I think what I walked away with after working on the first year was that I felt like our children in foster care are no different than maybe your mother, your father, your brother, anyone that you know personally that has mental health issues, that has behavioral issues, that you're responsible for. Even if they need to be in a facility because that's what's best for them and that's what their needs require, you still have to ask almost on a daily basis, which I think Jessica is going to attest to, are they receiving the best care for their needs? Are the medications best suited for their needs? Are the medications being properly administered? All the same common sense kind of questions we would ask for any one of our loved ones who are in a facility need to be asked for these children. One of the other things we learned during the first year of the project, psychotropic medications. Many children are on multiple, multiple, multiple psychotropic medications. Um, sometimes ones that should not be used together that are not best for their symptoms. And all I'm saying is it requires individuals to look carefully at what they're prescribed, why it's prescribed, is it best for that particular child. Now we've done two more years of the project and in 2012 we're doing it a little differently and I'm really excited and Ursula is one of the main people to help us drive this and bring this in-house to defects and that is we're combining cold case reviews or identified barriers with an already established practice in, within DFACS, which are permanency roundtables. And so the goal is to bring the two together and look at legal barriers for these children that are still um, lingering in foster care based on a new, the newest predictive model list of children. And so we're holding those roundtables with the lawyers, with all the participants to identify legal barriers and say, how can we overcome those? One of the other things I just wanted to mention is that in terms of psychotropic medications, um, the Cold Case Project was also able to utilize through bar 
Barton, a psychiatrist who was willing to consult on individual cases identified for children who may have a lot of medications or be on a lot of medications, and he could help educate all of us as to what the diagnoses mean, right, whether or not that requires medication, if so, what's the best medication, what are things to think about, symptoms to consider. So he really raised the level of education for DFACs as well as the child welfare attorneys and participants in terms of medications and what to look for. Um, I know I'm talking fast. Let me just ask, are there any basic questions about the project or what the goals of the cold case project have been and continue to be? All right. What I'm going to do is just tell you there is a case that did not appear on the cold case initially and then did in 2009. So again, this is a child who had been in foster care for a long time and had not yet achieved permanency. So the goal in looking at the case is why has he not achieved permanency? What barriers are there? How can they be overcome? He was removed from his home in 2001 when he was four. So keep in mind, we're in 2012 now. He's still in care. It's a very, very long time. Severe abuse, multiple placements, many diagnoses, many medications. On paper, the worst of the worst, right? These are the worst of the worst. You have all these combined for one particular child. That doesn't look good on paper. He's now 15. What I'd like to do at this time is turn this over to Jessica, who is um, a foster parent, who's going to tell us more specifics about T. And then I believe you have our contact information from today. If anyone has any questions about the project or how we're proceeding, um, feel free to contact me. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Michelle, for inviting me to be part of today's panel. I get very impassioned when I talk about tea, so you'll have to kind of take the professional out of it and, and feel the passion, too, because I love this little guy. So a year ago, I would have been talking to you as an executive director of the Court Appointed Special Advocacy Program, which is where I met T. Um, today, I get to talk to you as his foster mom. Um, I have fallen in love with this child, and one of the things that I, I want you all to take away from today is that there are a lot of children that need your assistance, and if you just do it one child at a time, we can eventually help all of these kids. So what I wanted you to do is just close your eyes for a second and think back to October of 2001. Now, unless there's something significant that happened, an anniversary or a birthday, you probably can't remember what you were doing in October of 2001. T can remember because that was the day that he was removed from his family after suffering horrific abuse and his world would forever change. What I want to do, since I know that I'm speaking to a more professional group of attorneys, you like to deal with facts, and so I just want to share some facts about T. <clears throat> he has been in care since October of 2001. So I met him in 2003 as a volunteer and was asked to just go into court and tell the judge what was in the best interest of this child, someone that could be a voice for the child. So that, that's what I did. Um, he was in a lot, of, a lot of distress, a lot of trauma he had suffered. Um, he was also a victim of abuse while he was in a foster home. So we tried to keep him safe, and then unfortunately he found himself in harm's way while he was supposed to be safe. <clears throat> he needed to be hospitalized in 2004, and his first and my first interaction with any kind of facility care was at Georgia Mental Health in Savannah, which I don't know if you remember when that facility was open and treating children. It was, it was kind of a scary place, but that's, that's where we started the journey. T has been in facility care since 2004. We're talking eight years. In January of 2005, T was transferred to a facility in the Atlanta area, and my parents actually live here in Atlanta. They have, that's how I was raised here. So I talked my parents into becoming advocates for T. He needed to have contact with somebody while he was at the facility. Um, if you've never been to one of these facilities and you're advocating for a child that's there, I would encourage you to go and take a look at what these kids are living in. So it is 
they were there for a reason. We think we're doing what's best for them, but until you've walked the halls, until you've seen what their rooms look like, until you see these children keeping their things in a paper bag because they might have to leave quickly, you just can't imagine what these children endure in these facilities. So as I said, I got my parents on board and they became CASA volunteers and they were sworn in down in my home county and they maintained a relationship with T um, since he's been in care since 2005. Um, my dad is here in the audience and he's actually maintained that relationship and has followed T throughout his time. So as you know, he's been in more than 15 placements and I just wanna share with you when you read about this young man on paper, he's really scary. His diagnoses include bipolar, PTSD, reactive attachment, and oppositional defiance disorder. And the oppositional defiance disorder label is quite a challenge because that is implied that he has some control over his behaviors. And those are the diagnoses that, that doom him to facility care. Um, you tell this young man he's got to be good for 90 days, and he's lucky if he can maintain himself for 90 minutes. He hasn't been with a family since 2004. He doesn't know what a family is. And a lot of your cold case kids are experiencing that time in care. To give you an idea about the psychotropic medication that T has been on, um, his cold case project attorney actually pulled his Medicaid card and over his time in care, he has almost 900 prescriptions. At one point in time, he was being dosed 16 times a day. He was taking medication. So he is going to be 15 coming up here this year. So I came in after I left my professional life. I decided I needed to do something for this child. So my husband and I relocated. We went through therapeutic foster parenting training and became a therapeutic home and I advocated for T to come live with us. So he spent, he, he moved to my, my city in November and we did a transitional period and then he moved in with us in January of this year. So when he arrived at my home, he, he weighed less than 90 pounds and he's 14 and he had not been through puberty yet. So they say that those things are a result of the psychotropic drugs, the facility living. He basically has lived his life as a caged animal. So the facilities have barbed wire. You have to be let in with a lock to go to the bathroom, let out of the bathroom. You just can't imagine. And for the children that need to be there, I do understand there's a purpose, but he didn't deserve to be there and he shouldn't have been there for all these years. Um, educationally, he's quite challenged. So he is supposed to be in ninth grade and we're working at about a fourth or fifth grade level. So facility education, basically you combine children ages six to 12, six to 18 into a room, there's an instructor, they pass some work around and if the children achieve it, great. And if they don't, then, then they don't. Um, let, me, let me tell you some good things that's kind of depressing. Um, I love to talk about him. I love when anybody will listen to me talk about him. So he spent 60 days with us before we had a disruption in the placement. But let me tell you about all the great things that happened in those 60 days. So he gained an entire pant size and he grew a shoe size and a half, one and a half shoe sizes. So he attended public school. So he trained in Taekwondo. He um, got to carve a turkey at Thanksgiving. He had never been in a fa with a family. He woke up Christmas morning and had presents under a tree. Um, one of the things he commented while he lived with us for these 60 days is that it was neat every night when he went to bed that there were pillows on his bed. Now, I'm always in search for a good pillow, but I can't imagine not ever having a pillow that that would be a luxury that this kid would think was the best thing. <clears throat> we signed him up for Sylvan Learning, and one of the things I want to share, what got him to my house is CBay funding. And I wasn't real familiar with CBA when I was in the professional side of things, but having become a foster parent, it has been a lifeline for us because T received the same level of care in an institution that he could get while he was in my home. We had therapists there daily. We had medicine management. We had anything that we needed. They funded a lot of things that the Taekwondo, um, Sylvan tutoring. So it is an amazing resource to get these kids out of the institutional lives into homes. So <clears throat> what I want to say to you is that T seems like he might be the exception, but unfortunately he's more the rule for your children that are in institution living. 
So we've got to make sure that we keep these children on the top of the court calendars. Um, six month reviews sometimes aren't enough. Sometimes you gotta do 30 day reviews. Sometimes for our case, we were conferencing once a week. So it is time consuming, but these children deserve not to be forgotten about. Um, my dad has said many times over the years that the only thing that T ever did wrong in his life was that he was born. He didn't contribute to any of this. It's not his fault. So <clears throat> what I want to share with you now is that T is getting ready to come back to my home. He's been away again, um, hospitalized for a period of time, and he is off of all medication. So he has been medicated for 10 years, and he is off of everything right now. And he just shared with me in a phone call that he actually feels better and doesn't think he wants to be on the medication anymore. So he's much clearer. He's got much more energy. He seems more vibrant. So I'm actually going to get to see him tomorrow. I've got to do a little more traveling, but I'll get to see him tomorrow. So the message I want to leave with you is that don't forget these kids. Keep talking about these kids. So I know that um, you get in a room of professionals and everybody might have their idea of what's best, but just keep coming to the table and keep talking about these children because they do not deserve to be in care. And there are families out there that will love these kids. I love T and I don't know that he'll get to continue to grow up with us forever. We're going to try it again, but I will always be that place that he can go home to at Thanksgiving or he can come home to Christmas. It's important that we have outside connections. It's important that even if these people connections aren't going to adopt just to have somebody that they can call during their weekly phone call or there's a dance next week that I'm going to attend a spring dance and I'm going to attend at the facility. So just just keep these children on the tops of your minds and keep talking about these kids and, and fighting for them to have a life. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I am going backwards. I am Ursula Davis. And uh, as Ashley spoke about, um, I have been involved with the Cold Case Project since um, probably early 2011. I started participating in the calls and hopefully gave um, some helpful support, not only to the Cold Case Fellows, but to our staff in the field as well. I've been with the Division of Family and Children's Services for going on 20 years now. I know, hard to believe. I look like I'm 10. But, um, and I've worked from being a case manager to being a supervisor, an administrator, a field program specialist, and now at the state level um, working over with the system of care unit. The vision, the mission, and the core values of the division I will let you read, I won't read them for you. But as it says, we need to strengthen our families. Strengthening families, whether it's biological families or whether it's families like Jessica, strengthening those families is what will help this population of children. And I hope that everyone agrees with that. Finding the ex exact ingredients to put together for that recipe to make it successful for every child. That's what we're working on with system of care. That's what we're working on with cold case. That's what we're working on throughout the state of Georgia and the nation. There's been a lot of uh, publicity lately in regard to psychotropic medication. I'm sure that many of you that work in child welfare have heard about that. All of our states are now mandated to come up with a psychotropic medication plan for children involved with child welfare, which is a good thing. It's a good thing. Um, it's been a long time coming. It's been an area that we've been looking at for a while, but I think now that we have the mandate and you have the, you know, the eyes on you, then everyone is really coming together a lot stronger to make it happen. And as a matter of fact, I got an email this morning on my way here that I checked while I was at the red light that said <laughs> that the psychotropic um, medication, the initial psychotropic medication plan for Georgia's Division of Family and Children's Services, which includes a consent process that will be mandated throughout the state with all of our counties, as well as a consultation and review process, was approved by our um, acting division director and um, 
acting deputy director. So I'm happy about that. That'll probably go out to our staff next week. And so again, that's just one step on that rung, uh, moving forward and, and getting to where we need to be for our children and our family. So what is system of care? I hope that everyone has heard of system of care by now. It's a philosophy that has been around for a while. DFACS, unfortunately, was a little slow jumping on the bandwagon, but, but we're going strong now. We were doing system of care work, but kind of in silos, different people doing different things at different levels. Even when I was down in the field, I was still doing that work and working with a lot of the people that I still work with now and a lot of the, the people that are on our panel today. But I felt like it was really necessary for us to have a concentration in that area and looking at how we're collaborating with our internal and external partners and how we can really make some things happen. We go to a lot of meetings, again, with all these people in the panel and several of you in the audience, I go to a lot of meetings with you. However, what do we do afterwards? And so I feel like having that concentration means that we're really following up and we're getting some things going. As of December 31st of 2011, the Division of Family and Children's Services had 3,239 children who were identified as having some uh, mental health or developmental uh, disability diagnosis. Now, that's a rough estimate. It's, it's very possible that there were more than that. I don't think there were few, but that there were more than that. And that doesn't take into account those youth who have dual diagnoses. And that was out of a total population of 8,159 youth that were in care, again, as of December 31st. And although that's only about a third, that really is a lot of children. Because when you think of those characteristics that Ashley spoke about, the number of placements that those youth have, the types of placements that those youth have, the length of stay in care, it's really serious. And not all of those youth are placed in an institutional setting. Most of them are probably in our higher level settings, which Ms. Yearby will talk about later. But those are still youth with those characteristics. Those are still youth who need services. Those are still youth who need family. So that's the work that we're going to be doing. Everyone knows what the CFSR is? Or better yet, is there anyone that doesn't know what the CFSR is? Okay, <laughs> it's the Child and Family Service Review. It's basically our federal review. It's when the feds come out and read our records and look at areas of our work that we're doing with our children and families in regard to permanency, safety, and well-being. Right now, the System of Care Unit is really specifically looking at well-being. Um, as time is going on, we're kind of branching out into, into other areas, but because my unit is pretty small right now, well-being is, is my basic focus. And so looking at those youth that have those high-end needs, those cold case youth that we've been discussing. So looking at what system of care philosophy, which we didn't make up, <laughs> um, compared to the CFSR, you can see that it really does address what is good practice, what is good work, what is the things that we want to do for our families and for our children. It, it's not rocket science. It isn't anything that's out of the ordinary. It's just really trying to figure out how we can make that work. Any questions about this? OK. And so again, our system of care unit wants to provide dynamic leadership. We want to be out there, we want to be seen, we want to be known, we want to be heard, we want to be included. It's funny when I come to meetings like this and someone says, oh, okay, so you're Ursula, and I laugh because I'm like, oh, I hope that's good. <laughs> but it's good that my name is out there in some way, shape, or form because then that means that conversation is happening and conversation can continue to happen. I had someone call me the other day from one of the institutional settings. Oh, we're looking at you know placing a child. We want to discharge them out of the PRTF, send them to an OTP. I heard you were the lady to talk to. Great, we're discharging, we're stepping down. Definitely, let's talk. So that, that's what we want to do. Collaboration, collaboration in terms of ideas, in terms of services, in terms of money. That's what system of care is all about. I do know T. 
I do know Jessica, even though I did not know her face until today. <laughs> so another one of those, those situations, we're always going to cross paths in regard to these kids, and that's good. I have no problem with you calling me, emailing me to talk about one of these youth. One of these high-end youth who need to have positive connections and the right services. DBHDD, which is the uh, Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities, Mental Health for the State of Georgia, they have not had a child and adolescent unit for a long period of time. This is very new. A concentration on our youth is new. And so we have a long way to go there. But they are working in partnership with the division, with DJJ, with Medicaid. We're all working together to find out what's going to work. Did I see a hand? Yes. No. Now I'm talking about at the state level, not in terms of the uh, Georgia regionals and them having those units, but at the state level having a unit that dealt specifically with children and adolescents. No. No. Which is surprising and, and which is very scary, but th that's the way that it was. And you know, in a lot of situations, children are kind of down here when it comes to the level of importance. And mental health in and of itself is still pretty taboo. I think it was Ashley that said, everyone here knows someone either in your family, friends, whoever, that has a mental health disorder. My aunt, my mother's sister, is diagnosed with schizophrenia. It's very difficult. And besides being a child welfare professional, I'm also a clinician. My grandmother doesn't listen to anything I tell her. <laughs> Not a word that I tell her. It's like, okay, whatever, little girl. So it's very hard. She's in denial. When, when my aunt really needs some help, she's in denial until things get really, really bad. So it, it's hard for everyone. And for a child, and to see those behaviors in a child, it's very disturbing. And you wonder, how can that happen? And what can you do? And so we're still trying to figure it out. One of the really great things that has been done is that uh, DFACS now has a state medical director who is a board certified child and adolescent um, psychiatrist. Her name is Ms. Alka Anasia. So I have been working very closely with Dr. Anasia. She's been working with DVHDD. She's been working with DCH. So we can look at some sharing of data and information to really see where our kids are in terms of medication, to um, come up with the, the stable, statewide consent process that I talked about a few minutes ago. So we really are making some positive strides, although I know we have a long way to go. So one of some of the things that we want to do are to improve our access to mental health services for youth with mental health or behavioral health needs. Access to services is very hard. Jessica can attest to that. Some areas, especially in the rural areas of Georgia, don't have services available for families. And those are a lot of times are the families that say, I can't do it and they send their children to institutions. And then when it's time for discharge, they say, I can't do it. And then they end up coming into foster care. So it's a vicious cycle. So that's one area that we're working with mental health to improve on. The effectiveness of the service provision, we must have evidence-based services. You have to look at what has worked to see if it works. Everyone with a diagnosis of bipolar is not the same. Their symptomology is not the same but you still want to look at what things have worked or have been shown to work. Improve our knowledge base and skill set of DFAC staff regarding mental health. There's a few of us that are clinicians, but most of us are not. There are social workers who deal with the social work side, not the clinical side. And normally what they've done in the past is if a psychiatrist says this is it, this is it, because they went to psychiatrist school. <laughs> so we're changing that a little and again going back to what Ashley said which is key and asking our staff look at it as a parent and again a lot of our staff are young they don't have children but still look at it as a parent as an auntie what is it that you would want for that child that you are responsible for you don't have to be a psychiatrist or a psychologist to kind of just know hmm that doesn't seem right let me ask a question 
So that's what we're looking at as well. Um, through cold case, there was some training that started and um, we're looking at continuing some training. Um, Dr. Anasia will be doing some training hopefully at the mid or end of the summer for our staff to continue that. We want to improve collaboration with our internal and external partners and organizations like you all. And we also want to reduce the length of stay of children and youth in PRTS. Yes, Ms. Friendly. Oh. I remember you from Fulton <laughs> County. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, what mechanism is there in place to audit the performance of the service providers? At this time, DBHDD does have a new fidelity unit, and that's exactly what they are doing. My um, members of my unit, including myself, meet with DBHDD through an MOU twice a month, every other Wednesday. And so those are things that we discuss, what's going on with the fidelity unit, how it is progressing. Also, in my particular unit, we will be starting a fidelity unit as well because we do monitor and have contracts with some of the uh, mental health providers as well. So hopefully with those two organizations, both having that monitoring plan in place, we're going to see some improvements in our service provision. Okay, and is there any way that, that uh, those of us who represent children in this area can you know, access that information so that we can kind of see what's going on with our, with the, with, you know, with the providers who are working with our children. Now, currently, the monitoring that's done through DBHDD is available on the APS website. And I'm sorry, I don't have that website information in my head right now, but if you want to send me an email, I think it's in my bio info, then I can send you that website link. And what they do is um, when they go out and do reviews, they do almost like a report card type of, of thing. And that is, that's available to anyone to look at. You're welcome. In regard to this, this last bullet, reducing the length of stay, uh, one, I'm sorry, yes ma'am? Um, I just wanted to, on the fidelity uh, monitoring, yes. are you guys going to be looking at the problem with placements, taking warrants out on children, either therapeutic group facilities or even PRTFs that a lot of kids end up getting charged while they're there? Although that is something that I deal with, usually with Rachel, who's sitting back there. <laughs> that is something that I, I kind of handle and deal with. In terms of fidelity, we're looking at service provision. You're talking more about the placements, which would be Diane. So you may want to hold that question for her when she comes up. Okay, but that it is sort of if they're providing services, but it ends up all getting going south because they decide that, they're gonna they're gonna charge a kid for something they're pretty much in there for. That's not something it's you guys the are looking unbundling, at. Unbundling, which means in the past a lot of our placement providers were also mental health service providers. But the feds told us we had to unbundle, so that's separate. And although we as the parent get to choose, and let's say uh, placement A is also a mental health provider through DBHDD, we can say, hey, placement A, we want you to be the service provider as well as placement provider, but we don't have to. So that's not always the case. Because the child is placed there does not mean that they're necessarily the service provider. Now, PRTFs are different. I don't want to get into Diane's thing, so I'm going to leave that alone for a minute, but PRTFs are different. And so theirs are all in one. And those are usually the ones that I do handle in partnership with Rachel and the staff in her unit. I know that doesn't totally answer your question, so, but I want to wait and let her speak, and then if it doesn't, you know me. You can call me and we can talk about it some more. Okay? Anyone else? Okay, James Hendricks is one of my staff members. He works specifically with the PRTFs. Anything PRTF, it's, it's, we call him Jim. It's Jim. And so he has two projects that he's working on right now. One is where he's looking overall at all children in PRTFs, how long they've been there, how we can get them out. And then two, he's looking at all youth in PRTFs who are 12 and under. Currently, we have 19 youth, 12 and under, who are in PRTFs. 
yeah, that's, that's not good. So yes, so he is looking specifically, he has a project that he's doing in partnership with DBHDD to work to get those kids out. And what Jessica said, I'm glad she was, was happy and gave a stamp of approval for CBAY. CBAY is Community-Based Alternatives for Youth. It's basically those same institutional type um, intensive services in the community. We want to utilize CBAY and our CMEs, which are care management entities, to, to help move those children 12 and under back into the community. Yes, sir. Children in DFAX custody only. Yes. 12 and under. There are 19 children. Oh, children. 19 children. I'm sorry. Yes, 12 and under years old. Right. Right. And we probably have about, don't quote me, maybe 84 DFAX youth total throughout the state who are in PRTFs currently, which is down. It, it, that's good. It really is good news. That is down. A year ago, we were probably at about 140 to 145. So we are down. And Jim is in there. He's going to the treatment team meetings. He's conferencing and staffing with our staff. He's educating them. He's helping them to locate and find services so that kids can move out. Yes. I'm sorry. That's OK. It's not. I just pulled it. It's we need not? to give it to him. No, ma'am. Okay. I just looked at the bios. Can I give it now? Excuse my full mouth. Sure. OK. U.M. Davis. <laughs> at dhr.state.ga.us. Reluctantly, I'm going to give you my cell number. <laughs> it's 404-432-3177. Yes, U.M. Davis at dhr.state dot g a dot u s any other questions okay i'm gonna let kate go thank you good afternoon everybody um, so i'm kate cantrell and i'm the director of programs with youth villages in georgia and alabama um, and just very briefly want to give you um, an overview of what what I do and, and what we at Youth Villages do. Uh, Youth Villages is a private nonprofit organization. Um, we operate in 10 states and the District of Columbia. We've been around for about 25 years and provide a wide range of services to children and families, ranging from psychiatric residential treatment, to group home care, foster care, um, and intensive in-home services. We've been in Georgia for just about four years now. We started in July of 2008 with a contract with DFAX uh, to serve youth in Fulton and DeKalb counties who had been out of the home for extended periods of time and who fell under the auspices of the Kenny A consent decree. And we were really tasked with helping DFAX move those young people to permanence. And um, so that's the type of work we've been doing for the past four years here in Georgia. Since then, we've expanded to um, serve additional counties in the Atlanta metro area, as well as to serve uh, DJJ youth in addition to the DFAX youth. Um, but the primary bulk of the cases we've served here have been reunification cases where we've really tried to work to move kids out of congregate care settings and back into the community with their families and, or identified caregivers. Um, <coughs> excuse me, the model that we use is a program called the uh, Intercept Program um, comes out of multi-systemic therapy, or MST, which uh, some of you may have heard of. Uh, we were actually the first provider to take MST out of clinical trials in 1994. Um, and since then, we've expanded the model, <clears throat> excuse me, to be able to serve child welfare involved kids as well as kids involved in the mental health system um, and non-system involved youth. And so that's what our Intercept Program is about. Um, what we do with that is that we have uh, family intervention specialists who carry very low caseloads, usually four or five families at any given time. Uh, they work with those families in the family's natural environment, so in the home, the community, schools, 
uh, see them at least three times a week, and they're on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week for crisis intervention and support. Um, and what we do is really help strengthen families and, and keep kids out of care or move them quickly out of placement and back home with their families. So um, I want to talk today um, about another cold case. You heard a, a little bit about T's case earlier. Um, and this case is uh, similar in some ways, um, but this, this is a child who was actually able to be reunified with his father. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about it. Um, I'm calling him David. That's not his real name. Um, but David and his siblings were taken into defects custody in 2002 when David was just five years old. Um, he was briefly placed in foster care, um, but due to some aggressive behavior and, and some other issues, he was pretty quickly placed in a psychiatric residential treatment facility where he remained for the next eight years. Um, so when we talk about that long-term institutional care, um, he was also very heavily medicated while he was in, the, in this placement. And so thinking back to some of the criteria that Ashley shared at the beginning, he really hit those, and, and he was a cold case. Um, and, you know, really at the time that um, he was referred to, to our program and, and identified as a cold case, the prevailing kind of consensus on this youth was that he would very likely be institutionalized for the rest of his life. Um, and he was 12 years old at that time. Um, and, uh, you know, it, that, that's a hard thing to swallow, <laughs> um, honestly, that a 12-year-old could never return to the, to the community. And so we began working with him. Um, and we, we got the referral from DFACS and had a real um, working partnership with DFACS from the beginning on this case. Um, we started working with him in uh, January of 20, 2010. Um, and we had actually worked with his father previously on bringing his two older sisters home. They were in foster care. And so we had a history with the family, and the father had made some real progress. Um, so our, our staff worked really closely with his dad, um, with DFACS, and with the residential facility, as well as some other community providers. And um, we were able to get him home um, on December 21st. 2010, and the family got to spend their first Christmas together since 2002, um, that year. And custody was granted to David's father in February of, of 2011. Um, I just checked on him just the other day, and he's still at home, happy to report. He's doing well. He's thriving, being in the community. Um, his medications have been drastically reduced, and he's doing much, much better. So I wanted to talk with you a little bit about uh, what made this case successful, um, because it didn't always look like it was going to be. Um, I, I actually talked with the family intervention specialist on our staff who, who carried the case um, and, and just asked her, you know, what, what do you think made the difference for this particular kid and this family? And the first thing she landed on was that there was true collaboration between the key players involved and that there was a real team effort to get this young man home. Um, and that meant that everyone had a common goal. Uh, everyone really was working towards getting him home. In the very beginning, there was a little bit of, there was some hesitance, some skepticism about whether or not he would actually be able to return home. Um, but we were able to make some real progress on that. And uh, dad was able to make a lot of progress and I think made people involved feel a little bit better about this child going home. And so really having that collaboration and coordinated planning with everybody who was involved. Um, Mac was actually involved on this case. Heather is going to talk in a few minutes. Um, there was a really involved CASA worker on this case, a child advocate. Um, and so there were a lot of people in addition to the DFACS case manager and the Youth Village's staff person um, who did a lot of work. The uh, congregate care provider, the residential provider, initially was really skeptical that this kid could function well in the community. Um, but they did get on board with it and supported visits and passes. Um, we had to do a lot with this young man. He had been in care since he was five years old. Um, and he didn't really know what 
normal life was. Um, he'd basically been institutionalized. And so a lot of the work that our specialist did was getting him out and exposing him to the community. And um, she started with two-hour passes and four-hour passes, then full-day passes, and then finally weekend passes with his dad. And it was a real progression. And, uh, and she really needed the buy-in and the partnership of the residential facility, which she got. And that made a huge difference for him. Um, and then we had tremendous support from all the system folks. So it, it, it ended up that uh, the whole team was, was really working towards this common goal. Um, th I think the thing that got everyone bought in is that this dad made, made such tremendous progress. Um, this is a father who, when we began the case, um, did not have appropriate housing. He was kind of staying wherever. Um, he wasn't working. He was smoking marijuana. He was just, you know, really not someone you'd look to and say, yes, we want to place a bunch of high need kids with this man. Um, but, you know, his heart was, was there and he just needed the right level of support and intervention, which, which he got. Um, and so our, our specialist helped him find appropriate housing. So we got him an apartment, made sure that it was a, an appropriate place um, for him to have children. It was in a safe area, um, made sure that he had a job. He had been working kind of odd jobs and um, doing whatever came his way. We got him a stable, steady job, helped him get some financial stability. Um, also, with, with the substance use, really talked with him about his choices and how these, you know, this choice to recreationally use marijuana was really a huge barrier, and he wasn't going to get his kids back unless he could get that under control. We have a question? Hold on, just a moment for the microphone, if you would. I have a client, I'm a child advocate attorney. I have a client right now who is in a residential treatment facility and there are several fairly nonchalant family members that just have not gotten him out of foster care. So must there be a headstrong, identifiable person identified before you'll come in or can you come in and try to make an assessment of who we should work with to get him out. We are able to, you know, we would certainly want to partner with the defects if this child is in defects custody and make sure that we are all in agreement about who, who we're looking at as a, as a possible caregiver. But we, that is something that we are able to do is to, to come in and talk with folks, do an assessment, make recommendations. Ultimately, um, it'll be the custodial agent who makes the decision, but, um, but yes, we can do that. And, and I think at first glance, um, a lot of folks would have seen this guy as a pretty casual, um, you know, minimally involved parent. But if you actually dug in and talked to him a little bit, he really wanted his kids back. He really just had lost hope that he could get them back. And, and as a result, his behaviors kind of reflected that. And, um, and so he, you know, we had a pretty headstrong, I think he, he compared a specialist to a drill sergeant at one point. So we had a pretty headstrong woman in there who really didn't take any funny business from this man. Um, and I think that made, that made a big difference. Okay, and I'm familiar with that case, as is my colleague here. Mm -hmm. And I remember when that case closed that the father was grateful that he did have that headstrong worker there. And he commented, and much was said about the fact that, you know, there were times when the father would relapse and, you know, go back and forth on various issues. And I think that what made the difference, well, I don't think I know what made the difference in this case was that that person stayed with that family, you know, and would not give up and, and would not give up you know, on the family. I remember being very moved by, you know, the father's statement because it's so seldom that they say thank you like that. And, you know, I was very impressed with the fact that he acknowledged the support that he got, you know, from that individual. I'm going to ask Ty Tyrone if he wants to add anything. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So some of the other things that um, our staff did with, with him were, you know, parenting skills. This is a, a man who had not been a parent for, you know, eight years. And the last time he had been a parent, his children were very, very young. Yes, we have a question. Hi, I also have a question. Um, I'm familiar with the case, too, since we worked on it in the Cold Case Project. 
I was wondering two questions. First of all, what is the financial cost of uh, supporting this family with this child being home as compared to the cost of being in a psychiatric residential treatment facility? And two, um, how long will you be able to continue that support? That's, those are very good questions. Um, generally speaking, the, the cost of, you know, I, I speak to our program itself. You know, there are lots of home and community-based um, options, but our program is generally about a third of the cost of a placement in a psychiatric residential treatment facility. Um, and so that's, that's the difference right there. Um, so yeah, so parenting skills we did, you know, really, you know, how do, how do you be a parent to a 13-year-old boy? And um, how, you know, what do, what do you need to have in place? A lot of planning around safety and supervision. I mean, this is a kid who had been in a structured institutional-like setting for so many years. We had to make sure that he was going to feel safe when he went home to a, a much more free setting. And so that's really where those visits and passes came in. There were a lot of trial runs to get it right before he was home for good. Um, you know, making sure that, he, that this dad had a good support system. This is a single father with uh, several children in his home. And so we had to make sure that he had an adequate support system. Um, and then making sure that they had access and knew how to access all of the community resources that were available to them. Um, and that's really where some of the other community stakeholders came in and helping make sure that we had some really good stuff lined up for this kid when he got home, um, you know, school, all of those sorts of things. Um, you know, the other thing I mentioned, but that regular family visits and passes are just huge. When you're trying to, to move a kid out of congregate care, they have to spend a lot of time with their family. They need to have that, those trial runs and that, expo that exposure and getting out. Um, and being in the community. Um, and, you know, there were a lot of really remarkable professionals involved in this case, but I, I want to make the point that none of that would have been possible had it not been for this dad. He's a really remarkable man, and he was really determined that he was going to have his family back together. And so while all of the professionals did a lot of really great stuff, at the end of the day, it was him who pulled it together and um, brought his family back together. So I, I wanted to make sure I pointed that out. One of the things that I just wanted to comment on about those visitor, the weekend passes, how critical they are. One of the challenges that we have had is that T's behavior did not meet the qualifications yeah. to be allowed to leave the facility. And so we ultimately had to have the, the defects custodian basically write a letter that said, he could be released against medical advice because that's what we were doing when we were bringing him home. Um, those weekend visits were critical in knowing that our family could work together and, you know, let my children and, and identifying where our problems were. So I just, I don't know how specifically your agency works, but that has been a huge challenge for us um, in, in getting those passes because they don't meet the behavior assessments while they're at the facilities. And I can tell you for the 60 days that T came and visited us, we had not one incident of anything that, that required any kind of intervention or crisis management or anything like that. Yep. I, I'm glad you said that. I'm going to move to the next slide. Um, you know, one of the things, the way I wanted to end my segment was I wanted to talk about just some general lessons learned. You know, we, we've done this type of step down and reunification work on this case, but on lots and lots of others, um, you know, for kids coming out of PRTF, um, but also kids coming out of RBWO, group home placements, um, detention, while each of those placements are very, very different and facilities are very, very different and the services the kids receive there are different, there are a lot of commonalities around what on the community side makes it a, um, an effective process to get them stepped out. Um, and I'm going to address that very thing um, in just a moment. I'm just curious, how long um, can you get funding to remain in this family's life? Oh, I didn't answer that part of your question. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, we actually closed the case um, in August of last year. And, um, and I'm happy to report he's still doing really well. We check in. <laughs> we, they, don't, they don't go very long without being in touch with us. Um, and so, you know, we were able to stay involved that long. Um, and then they really didn't need us anymore at the level, you know, we, we're pretty intensive, you know, three times a week in your home, 24-7 um, on call, that's a lot. Um, and so th they really didn't need us any longer at that point. 
had they needed you longer, would there would have there been, been the opportunity funding for funding? Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, we right now our program is um, funded for for DFACS involved youth. We're funded by DFACS. For DJJ youth, we're, in, we're funded by DJJ. And so we we do have really great partners at DFACS, and we have opportunities and um, an avenue to request additional time. And so we do have that that possibility. And there have been some cases where we have gotten extensions. Um, they certainly need to be justified. Um, but if we can justify it, we've been successful in getting extensions. Yeah. So, um, so a couple of the kind of the key things that um, I wanted just to, to share with you all, because I know you all have um, are involved in cases where kids are in congregate care settings. and. Um, one of the, the things that's really critical is there has to be some effective home and community-based services in place. Um, you know, one of the things with kids in being in placement, they can be in the best possible facility, receiving the best possible care, but if you don't change what's going on at home and in, in the environment at home, they're not going to be successful most likely when they come back out um, because a lot of times the behavior that we would deem dysfunctional that that child is engaging in is actually quite functional when you consider their environment. And so it's really important to, to be working with the family and doing some home and community-based services. We have a question back here. It, yeah, not to digress a little bit, but it speaks to just what you said. Mm -hmm. In terms of the father and the fatherhood, um, how did you, did you, did you uh, enable the fatherhood initiative program or what, what made you go to the father? I mean, we're reaching out more in the state trying to get more fathers involved. I think there's a national referendum on it as well. How did you decide to go that route? Well, the, he he was the, the the person. I mean, he was the only one there. I'm trying to remember. Mom, the, the, the kids had actually been removed from their mother um, and due to um, neglect. She had, she had left them alone, and she had some drug issues and some other issues. Um, and I want to say she's not even around um, I can't I honestly don't remember the details and I apologize for that but but he was the person identified by defects as being the um, the placement resource and so that's really how how we, we came about working with him no we we do and certainly probably if you looked at, at our, our cases we'd probably see more moms than dads uh, I mean I think that's that's the way it works, but but certainly we do. And, and, and one of the things that our staff does is tries to do a, a pretty exhaustive assessment of what family members um, are available, even just for support, you know, even if, if, if they're not a placement option. Um, so we're always looking at fathers, for sure, and, and at the paternal side, because sometimes there are resources, aunts, um, you know, grandmothers, uncles, you know, on the paternal side that might not be found right away. Thank you. So um, anyway, we really think you, know, you need to have someone working with the, the um, family and the caregiver, and you have to really prepare the, the parent or caregiver for that use to return home. So that's a really big piece, and, um, and that should happen prior to that, to that youth coming home. Um, you have to have collaboration um, with everybody involved. And I'll tell you, we've, I've worked on cases where <laughs> there has been some dissent among the key players around what is actually best for that kid, you're going to go nowhere if, not, if everyone's not on the same page. And so I would encourage you all, if you're working on a case and you have, um, if there are key players who are not bought in to that kid returning home, I think that needs to be addressed first and foremost because otherwise you're going to be spinning your wheels and working at cross purposes. So it's really important for everyone to get um, on, on the same page and all be working towards a common goal. Um, along similar lines, the congregate care provider can do a lot to really support a successful step down. Um, it's really important that, first of all, they believe that that child can go home um, and that they integrate this goal into the services that they're providing. Um, the, the issue that was just raised around visitation and community passes are it's just critical. Um, and we have seen that happen so many times where a kid acts out in the middle of the week, he's got a weekend pass planned, and the pass gets yanked. And um, what we always recommend is that that should not be a consequence. Um, that is a part of treatment. 
that is a, a critical part of that child being able to return home. And so you shouldn't pull a pass or a visit unless there's a safety issue. And I will throw that caveat out. If, if there's a legitimate safety issue where truly that child is not gonna be safe or the community is not gonna be safe, <laughs> then that's a different story. But if it's not a safety issue, that kid needs to be able to go on that pass. And I'll tell you, it's actually really empowering if the parent or whoever the, they're going on pass with has to enforce some consequences while they're on pass. I mean, that, that can happen. And it's a great trial run for that parent or caregiver to be able to try to do that um, because we certainly want to make sure kids are held accountable and responsible for their choices. Um, but we don't want to pull those things as consequences because they really are um, not just privileges, they are part of actual treatment. I just wanted to address a couple issues that come up when you talk about preparation for the family. Mm -hmm. um, with regards to, to, to the kids who are in treatment facilities, especially the ones who are in facilities that are far away from their families, what I see coming up a lot is that um, in terms of visitation and the parents attempting to get involved with the kids, you know, therapy. Um, the parents are trying to work, and so the out, you know, the parents have to work, and the meetings are generally set up during other people's working hours, which are also the parents' working hours. Um, I've had cases where I've made suggestions to the therapist that they try and include the parents in by a telephone, you know, on some stuff. Then, with regards to um, uh, visitation and stuff like that, and this is becoming, I think, more of a problem I'm, I'm hearing this year because I'm hearing that the defects transportation funds, you know, are, are limited or, you know, uh, 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 not what they used to be. And that generally happens around May. Um, and so I'm getting complaints that, well, you know, I can't, I can't get my, my child transported. And a lot of the treatment uh, facilities don't provide that transportation. They rely on defects, you know, to set that up. So that tends to be, you know, a problem that I'm seeing in terms of, you know, attempting to work with the family, you know, on a realistic basis. It, it's not fair to put a child down in coastal you know, and then, you know, limit, you know, the time and distance limit, you know, the ability of the parent to see the child and to, you know, be involved in, you know, in their process. So, I mean, um, does your agency, like, step in to provide, like, to provide transportation and, and to facilitate, you know, those visits? We, we do, we are able to do that. Um, that is something that is part of our program. Um, certainly when you're talking about great distances, I mean, that, that's a legitimate problem. And you know, we've, we've had situations where we've worked to have the child moved to a facility closer to where the family is, if that exists. I mean, you know, sometimes you're dealing with the reality of just where services are. Um, but yes, you know, that is something that we are able to do is provide transportation. What about the issue of meetings that are critical for the children also being during the parents? Right. Working, well, um, I can speak for, you know, our, our program, our staff are available 24 seven and, um, they do most of their work prob well, I mean, depends on the, what the, on the family, but we do a lot of evening and weekend work. Um, you know, the expectation is that we meet with families when they can meet with us. Um, and so, you know, that's on the community side, but we would certainly advocate the same way if, if a child were in placement and we were trying to facilitate family sessions um, with the child, um, we would certainly advocate on behalf of the family um, to the provider, the congregate care provider, to make available evening or weekend um, sessions as well as best we could. So the, I think the last thing I, I, that I haven't spoken to, so you know, we have visita visitation and home passes. The only other thing I'll, I'm going to mention is that, um, because I, I've just seen this happen so much, is that I think we all need to have appropriate expectations around what the behaviors of the youth are going to look like as step-down approaches. Um, you know, as even if things are going really, really well, as the time for that child to return home approaches, it's only natural that his or her anxiety is going to go up a little bit. Um, and what happens for some of our, our youth is when their anxiety goes up a little bit, 
they start to act out a little bit. <laughs> and um, I've seen this happen where kids have, es their behaviors have escalated. They have lost levels or points or, or whatever it is that, 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 you know, had the structure in the congregate care setting. And very quickly, their step down date gets postponed. Um, and it can really be a perpetual kind of process where every time you get close, that happens and the date gets pushed out. And so I, I just mention it because I think it's worth um, all of us involved on these cases to really challenge that way of thinking and to, you know, really question what's going on with this kid. You know, do his or her behaviors really um, reflect a risk? And, and, and do we really need to, for safety reasons, talk about changing that step down date or are these behaviors really a pretty normal response to a high anxiety situation? And can we address it in a different way that isn't going to continually push out the, the step down date? So there are lots of things like that. That's a real kind of little thing. I've just seen it happen so often. I, I really wanted to make sure I mentioned it. Do you have a question? Do you find that there's a big difference in the length of uh, a stay between what kind of insurance the child has, private insurance versus state Medicaid through foster care versus CMEs? Has anybody um, looked at the how they compare? I, I don't have you know a real good breakdown in terms of an actual any actual data. Um, you know we, we actually operate youth villages we have this in-home program but we also operate a PRTF um, you know as many of you know we merge with Inner Harbor in Douglasville and so I know from that side of things that we do see great differences based on who's managing the utilization um, in terms of you know PRTF lengths of stay and I don't know if you're going to talk about that at all Diane okay um, but you know there are differences there um, you know, really, usually when we get involved in the in-home side, you know, we, we would actually actually love to have a problem with funding being continued for residential care, because usually at that point, that kid has kind of gotten stuck, and it's really our task to, to help get them out. I want to touch on something that you said about when the kids start acting up as they get closer to step down, um, and I'm a, a child attorney, and this is what I'm seeing. I'm, kids come into care in the deprivation because of some conduct generally by the parents. The parents get their issues together. In the meantime, the children have, you know, due to separation anxiety and all that stuff and some other stuff, they have developed these mental health issues that put them into some kind of facility. So we get to the point where the parents have gotten themselves together, but then the facility is saying, the child can't go home because of the issues. And then we have to remind people the child did not come into care because of the issues, you know, that the child had. The child came into care because of the issues that the parents have, which the parents have now addressed. Therefore, deprivation technically does not exist. And so we, what we have is parents are saying, I got myself together. I'm ready to take care of my, my child. Send them home. And the facility is saying, no, we don't believe that you can deal with it. You know, help me with that. Yeah. Well, and that's really where you need, you need some good home and community-based services um, to, to really, and, and Ursula has a comment on that, too. We'll get her the microphone. Um, but I would say, you know, we do see that all the time. And I, I think our challenge, I know, on the in-home, you know, with our in-home program is that we have to prove that that child, yeah, sure, that child might have some, some issues. They might have some behavioral issues, some emotional issues, but that doesn't necessarily mean they have to be in a facility. Um, there are a lot of those types of issues that can be dealt with just as effectively, if not more effectively, in the community with adequate and appropriate services. In the community or in the home? That's what I mean, I'm sorry, in the home. In, in the home with, with effective services. Ursula, So you? two statements around that. And I'm assuming we're talking about a PRTF, a psychiatric residential treatment facility. A psychiatric residential treatment facility can make the recommendation that a youth needs to have continued stay based on the criteria that they have. But whoever the custodian is, and I say that because there aren't just DFACS kids there. There are some that are in parental custody. There's some in DJJ custody. There's some in Department of Education's custody who are in PRTS. 
If they say, I want my child out of the PRTF, then the child leaves the PRTF. It may be against medical advice, but you can still do it. You still have that choice to do that. Um, programs like CBAE are, are really good options in terms of if the child still meets the criteria for PRTF, then they can possibly get CBAE. You cannot get a CBAE waiver if you don't meet the criteria for PRTF. So that's a good way to do that transition. But again, the bottom line is if the custodian, whomever they are, says I want my child out, the child leaves. And so often there is, you know, VFAC says, if the, if, the, if the facility says we don't think the child's ready to go home, mm -hmm. and VFAC is the custodian, mm -hmm. VFAC is not going to make the recommendation. The child's parent is saying, I want my child home, I'm prepared to deal with my child. So, you know, you're saying. So, you're I talking about you're everyone needing to get together yeah, I'm and about really have a good conversation. I got custodian you. and the child's parent. Right. And that's why everyone needs to really get together and talk about that case and talk about what can be done and what's appropriate for that child. Because I have seen it done. I did it myself as a permanency expedite. They leave it. I don't care what y'all say. So, <laughs> so, it can be done. It is done. It may not be done in cases that you feel it should be done. And so, advocate, have that discussion. There, Everyone needs to come to the table. What is it that that parent needs to be successful in taking care of their child? And then back to the original question about the different insurances. Every insurance, whether it's a CMO, like a mayor group, any of those, or APS who does uh, the Medicaid for our children, or children with SSI, or children with adoption uh, who've been adopted, they have their own criteria for medical necessity to be in a PRTF, to initially get in there and to continue to be in there. And so that may be one big difference in regard to length of stay. All right, well, if there are no further questions, I'm going to um, adjourn us for a 10-minute break. So if you all need to use the restroom, stretch your legs, um, and we'll come back together, it looks like, right about at 2 o'clock, okay? Hello. First of all, I have to kind of apologize a little bit. I was telling Kate, I've been coughing a little bit. I have that allergy turned into infection kind of thing going on. So I really apologize if I like burst, start coughing or sound weird. I'm on some cold medication. So who knows what will come out of my mouth today. <laughs> um, and uh, I only have one slide. It's kind of a joke among my panel that I'm the one that has one slide. But I always have a lot to say. If you know me, you know I talk a lot. So. Um, MAC is the Multi-Agency Alliance for Children. Just a little bit about me. I actually worked at a um, CNA uh, psychiatric unit for the first couple of years when I first moved to Georgia. And then I worked for a therapeutic foster care agency for about nine years. And I approved families. I was a, uh, what we call a family consultant, worked directly with um, foster parents. I trained foster parents. And then about eight years ago, is it eight years? Yeah, I think it's eight years. <laughs> eight years ago, I became the executive director of MAC. Um, MAC is a collaborative of eight different agencies. The agencies have changed some over the years. Um, we provide a full continuum of services from uh, therapeutic foster care and foster care all the way up to psychiatric residential treatment facilities and everything in between. Um, MAC has been around since 1996, so we've been around for quite a while. Um, we're the only network of providers in our state currently that's a formal network. MAC is its own 501c3, and we're accredited by the Council on Accreditation as a network. And the reason why that's significant is because um, we were the second network in the country to be accredited, and we just finished our reaccreditation, and we're the only network accredited in the state of Georgia, and I think, um, well, in several states. <laughs> um, anyway, so that's kind of who we are and what we do. Um, my personal belief is coming from working in a psychiatric hospital, working with therapeutic foster care, um, and working with kids in, in care, um, and working on now being on this side, I work with multiple providers. So I see the landscape of the provider community in a very different way because I'm not just a provider, but I work with providers. I work with DFACs. I work with, um, with multiple kinds of providers. And I think that that gives me a little bit of a unique perspective on some things. Uh, which I'll share with you today. Um, so one of the things, oh, I just want to mention too, 
I'm talking a little bit about Mac. We're part of the Georgia Youth Opportunities Initiative, and we also house Georgia Empowerment. If you've ever heard of Georgia Empowerment, it's a group of current and former foster youth that do advocacy work. We have um, empowerment groups in 12 of the 17 counties, or are they 15 counties now? There are 15 counties, and we're in 12 of the 15 regions. Sorry, 12 of the 15 regions. Um, our group has done a lot of work with advocacy. They had Medicaid um, passed. They helped advocate to have Medicaid passed from 18 to 21 through the Chafee Medicaid Act, which means that um, any youth who ages out of foster care at the age of 18 and is no longer in custody is eligible through Chafee Medicaid to keep their foster care Medicaid up through the age of 21. That's really important, and I always like to say that whenever I have any kind of audience, because health insurance is really important. And um, not all the DFACS workers in all the counties know about the Chafee Medicaid Act. Not all the youth know about it. Um, so I always try to take the opportunity to make sure I mention that. Um, and if you have questions about that, you can always go to, the web, go to our website or email me, and I'd be happy to um, hook you up with information on how to make sure that your youth has health insurance. Um, and I could sit here and talk for um, all day on Georgia Empowerment and all the work that we do with transitioning youth, but I won't. Um, I do want to mention the Teen Parent Connection real quick because we're, it's a system of care that was funded through the Governor's Office of Children and Families, and we work with pregnant and parenting teens who are in defects custody. Um, so I just wanted to mention that because I think that's important. It's a, an important population that a lot of people don't think about. Um, Okay, so our goal within our continuum is to keep kids in the lowest level of care possible. We kind of have a, um, we kind of think of ourselves as having a niche, if you will. We really work with the kids that are in PRTFs. We have two PRTF partners that are part of our network. Um, and we work really well with them. Our goal is to keep kids out of PRTFs as much as possible, even though we have PRTFs as partners. PRTFs serve an important part of our continuum of care. They are important. We need to have them for those kids that need, the, need that level of care. But they don't need to be there for years. They don't need to be there for a year. <laughs> they don't need to be there for multiple months. They need to be there for short periods of time while they're unsafe to themselves or others until they're ready to reunify and get back into the community. This should not be a long process and it shouldn't be rocket science, but for some reason it is. Um, so I say that because of the kids that we get referred, over 80% of our kids in both the, we also serve, we're a CBA provider and I'll talk a little bit about that. But if the kids that we serve over 80% have either been in a PRTF or are in a PRTF when they get referred to us. So we're talking about these kids that have been in PRTFs and that are at risk to be in a PRTF. And most of them have been in, been in PRTFs either multiple times or for multiple years. So keep that in mind. Over 50% of our population live in foster homes. Now, that doesn't happen overnight, and that's not easy to do. So when you have this, hot, this level of child that has all of these multiple needs, you need a whole, as Kate said, a village <laughs> to help them be in the community and be successful. Um, I say that, the, the, I wanna make sure that everybody's really clear too about the continuum. We talk a lot about congregate care and congregate care and congregate care. Well, there's lots of different types of congregate care. There are ILP programs that's considered congregate care, which are helping those youth who are getting ready to turn 18 and are aging out of the foster care system, who don't want to reunify with their family or can't, or want to re reunify with their family but can't, <laughs> um, and want to be on their own. They're looking for college. They're looking for independent living. They want an apartment. They have a job. There's those kids. That's also congregate care, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, another level of congregate care is what we call in our world maximum watchful oversight. Maximum watchful oversight is the step underneath PRTF. And in my opinion, it should be treated like a PRTF. I think congregate care at maximum watchful oversight should be for short-term interventions when kids can't be in the community for some reason. They need extra help. They need extra care. They need extra therapy. They need extra something. And that they shouldn't be there for long periods of time. I don't think it's okay. I don't think it's okay for a kid to grow up in a PRTF for eight years. I don't think it's okay for a kid to grow up in a high-end residential treatment center for eight years either. Um, now, you know, and 
I want to say too that um, some kids need all of those things. They're scared of families. They're scared of being in families. They've been abused in a family. They may have been abused in a foster home. I think that what we need to do is help them feel comfortable and relearn how to live in a family appropriately. So one of the things that we do in our program that we're very proud of is we do a lot of respite. So we may have a kid in a PRTF that we're, we don't get paid if we have a kid in a PRTF. I just want to be clear about that. That's a Medicaid thing. Um, but if we have a kid that we're working with in a PRTF, we'll pay for them to go to respite. If we have a kid in a high-end uh, congregate care um, CCI placement, we'll pay for them to go to respite so that they can practice living in a family. Because sometimes that's what they need to do. And their therapy need, therapist needs to be involved, and they need to learn how to do that. Um, I'm a big fan of, I do not believe that kids should be in institutions for the holidays. If, for, if they don't have to be in an institution, they shouldn't be for the holidays. Who, who wants to be in the institution for the holidays? We actually spend over three times the amount of respite we do every other month of the year in the month of December. Because I believe, and so do my colleagues, the kids should be in families for the holidays. And so we make, <clears throat> we make a lot of effort to make that happen. So um, I think that therapeutic foster care too, I think whenever you're talking about kids, we talk a lot about permanence. And I think permanence is awesome. I mean, everybody deserves that. Um, but sometimes kids need that step in between before they can go live with an adoptive family to learn how to live with an appropriate family. And therapeutic foster care is a great way to do that. I think that kids that are adoption eligible and living in institutions, it'd be better if they're living in a family while they're waiting for the perfect family to come along to adopt them. Um, and sometimes the therapeutic foster family actually does adopt them. So I think you have to be really open-minded about some of that. I run across a lot of defects workers and cost workers and court appointed to special advocates and all of those things. I guess those are cost workers. Sorry, medication. But um, I run across a lot of people that say, no, we don't want them to have another placement move. We want them to just get adopted. OK, well, do you have a family? Like, what have we done for adoption? You know, let's get moving. No, we don't have a family yet. I think we, we put the book out, and we're going to the fair on Saturday or whatever. And we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's going to take a while. Even if you find a family, it's going to take at least six months for that adoption to even get to the place where the kid can actually live with the, kid, with the family. They could be living in a foster home, in the community, going to school, learning how to be a kid. That's better, I think than living in an institution while we're working on that. So um, let's see, where am I? Um, so that's kind of what we do. Those are some of the examples of some of the things that we do. I want to talk a little bit about the private provider community. Like I said, I have eight partners. Um, I have some, several of them provide therapeutic foster care. Again, everything up from PRTF all the way ILP, maximum watchful oversight. Um, all of that kind of stuff. Um, the private provider community has been pretty much in shock. They've gone through their own trauma, if you will, over the last five years. And that is because many of these providers are 100-year-old orphanages. They believe in raising kids. That's what they've always done. And we have to be respectful of that, I think. That doesn't mean we have to agree with it. It doesn't mean we have to support it. But we have to understand where they're coming from. I have two of my partners actually three of them now, three of our partners are over 100 years old. And they started out as orphanages. And so we have to kind of, so that's what they were built to do. They were the place, the safe place that we sent our abused kids to go live. Well, now we have other options, and we have to remember that too. Um, I think the private provider community also, I think Ursula mentioned the whole unbundling thing when we went from being residential treatment centers and providing all of the therapeutic services within the organization to now being outpatient mental health services and what we now call room board and watchful oversight. It's gotten separated. And I think that um, with that separation came a lot of identity crisis for some of our providers. They didn't really know where they fit anymore. They used to be this great therapeutic group home, and now they're 
just a group home with more staffing and have outpatient services? Like, how does that work? So they're going through some changes too. Psychiatric residential treatment facilities, you know, they used to be called in intensive residential programs. That's not the same thing as a psychiatric residential treatment facility. So when we talk about kids that have been in foster care since 2001, 2004, they weren't living in what we now know as a PRTF. They were living in what used to be an intensive residential treatment center. They were different. Those centers also, they, ra they saved the poor abused children and raised them. That's a very different mindset than where we are today. Today, we are, PRTFs are short-term interventions. They should not be used for more than three to six months. We need to get them in, get them out, get them to treatment. Exactly what Jessica said, you get them in, you have them in for 60 days, and then you bring them right back out to your family. That's what they're designed for. That's what they should be used for. That's a shift. That's a very huge shift for private providers. It's a huge shift for DFACs. It's a huge shift for everybody. And I can say very clearly to you, and I say this to my providers all the time, PRTFs are short term. We have to get in there, we have to stay in there, we have to watch them, we have to help them move out. I battle this with DFACs, no offense. <laughs> And defects has come a long way. I don't, want to, I don't want to make it sound like they're not. But a lot of defects workers I work with, and I know Diane and Ursula will agree with me, will say, well, I don't need to find a placement. That I did. They're in a PRTF. I found a placement. I don't have to worry anymore. And we're like, no, 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 no. They got admitted on Friday. We're having a meeting on Wednesday to talk about where they're going when they leave. And they're like, but I don't need to do that because they're in a placement. I don't need you anymore. And sometimes we get kicked off the case because of that, because we want to have a meeting within seven days of the PRTF admission. And some providers will not do that. Kate would never do that. She would show up. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> to a, boss, a therapeutic foster parent and she was telling me that um, and I don't know how this works but that some of I think she was part of a network of um, therapeutic foster parents mm -hmm. and um, she was being considered for a placement for a child and after talking to the people in her network and reviewing the child's records, um, she decided that she wasn't going to take the child because there was a history of placement, you know, and then there'd be a disruption, and then they go into the facility, mm -hmm. you know, a history of that back and forth, back and forth, uh -huh. to the point that she was saying that she, as a therapeutic provider, you know, had concerns about, you know, whether she could deal with the child because of that kind of in and out. So I hear what you're saying about, you know, short term, get them in, get them out. But I mean, at some point, doesn't that also have a negative impact on the child? Because unless they're going back to the same place, but a lot of times they're not going back to the same place. They come out the facility and they're going to a different place. Mm -hmm. So I mean, how do you, how do you, how does, how is that coordinated? Um, PRTF should be used when kids um, are at risk of endangering themselves or others. That is the definition of being in a PRTF, more or less. I mean, there's other stuff, but that's pretty much the bottom line. Um, if a kid's being considered for a PRTF, that should be the placement of last resort. And I say placement as in movement, not as in a placement. Um, so if a kid qualifies for a PRTF, First of all, if I'm working with a kid and a kid qualifies for a PRTF, of course, the first thing I'm going to ask is, why can't we do CBAY and keep them in the community? Why can't we put more resources at the table to keep them in the community? Why do they have to go to the PRTF? What is the reason why they have to go to the PRTF? And sometimes there's a really good reason. You know, they tried to strangle the other kid in the home. Okay, so they need to move. <laughs> we need to do something because there's safety concerns in the other, um, with the other families. We do a lot of work to try to keep kids from moving around. Um, the way that we're structured, because we are a network of providers, we can add other resources for TFC families to make sure that they have what the tools that they need to keep the child so that they don't move around. Like respite, like um, extra behavior aid services, like a life coach, 
like um, tutoring services or in some kind of one-on-one -on -one at certain times of the day or certain times of the week. Um, it could be a specialized therapist. Medicaid pays for um, a lot of therapy stuff, but sometimes kids need a very specialized therapist that Medicaid may not pay for. And we'll pay for that because that's going to make the difference between them staying in that placement and then moving along. And I think that as providers in general kind of, kind of get the, into that mode, then um, you know, that's when you do see a lot of placement moves. Now, I think that for that particular case you were talking about with the therapeutic foster parent thinking through whether or not they're going to take a child because of placement moves, I think that when you talk about a large number of placement moves, most of the kids in our program, like I think the average number of placement moves last year was like 13, with the range being from 7 to 32. So if you see, we have a lot of, right, so you have a lot of placement moves, but I I just, we talked about a kid just last week who had 30 placement moves but has been in the same family for the last two years. It can happen. Just because you have a lot of placement moves doesn't mean they're going to come into your home and disrupt it. It means that you're going to have to make some, you're going to have to work with your team and as Kate said, you have to collaborate together around what the underlying needs are and why does this child keep moving. There's a reason. And being part of Georgia Empowerment, I'm here to say the best thing to do is ask the kid. Why, what do you want? Why, where, why do you keep moving? What do we need to do that's different? We approach things, we're very into youth voice, and so we approach things a little bit differently. And I certainly would encourage everybody, for any kid that you're working with, to talk to them, get the team to talk to them, let them be part of that process. If we have a kid, even in a PRTF, who's looking and we're thinking therapeutic foster care is the best placement for them, if we've got more than one family that's an option, or even if we've just got one family, the child gets to pick which family they want to live in. Not us. I don't care. I want them in a family. I have three. It's your decision. Who You can do respite. I'll pay for you to go to respite for, with each of these families. I'll pay for gas cards and McDonald's or whatever so that you can meet the family, and then you decide. And then the child usually has a lot more... Uh, incentive, you know, they, they're kind of bought into that process because they got to pick. We do the same thing with ILP programs. My deal with all of the kids that I've worked with since I started my career was if you want something, you do what you need to do and I'll let you have whatever choice you I can give you. If safety is an issue, I will make the choice for you. Otherwise, your placement is your decision. And so I think that makes a lot of, um, I think that makes a big difference. I think you really have to talk to the kids. And I used, to, I used to do placement in therapeutic foster when I worked in therapeutic foster care. And I used to, whenever I would call a family and talk to them about a kid, I was always just say, just meet them. I would hate to talk to them about all the kids' behaviors and all the bad things until you meet them because he's a kid. You know, he's seven. So he's been in 10 homes. He's been in a psychiatric residential treatment facility and he was severely abused. But he also likes baseball. He really loves um, the idea that you have a dog. He really wants to be in public school. And you live really close to his sister that he hasn't seen in three years. Those are the things that make the placement, not all the other stuff. OK. <coughs> I'm sorry, my voice, too. I'm trying to project, but this stupid cold thing. Mm. OK, so back to the private provider communities. The private provider communities, you know, even these long-time orphanages, um, and I say that to, to kind of remind you that kids grew up there, like they'd go there at four and stay there until they were 18 and that was their home and they were, you know, Uncle Bob's kids or whatever. That's kind of, that's the mentality of the where these kids kind of came from. But um, uh, anyway, most of the providers, especially the ones that I work with, I really push my providers of all levels of care to go to really reach out and do more community-based services, even if it's something as simple as um, providing behavior aid services for kids outside of your program. Um, I'm trying to get residential programs to really start working with kids that are living in the community so that they can learn how to do that. And I think that Programs that have community-based services as part of their overall program, especially these big CCIs, um, they do a better job transitioning kids out into the community when they have community programs as part of their 
um, continuum within their agency. Not all have that ability or capability, but I keep trying to push them to think about what ways they can help the kids that are transitioning out of their program keep transitioning. We are a care management entity and we work with CBAY um, currently. And um, we, um, we have uh, over 200 kids in our, in our care management entity program. And about 50% of those kids are in DFAX custody and the other 50% are in um, parental custody or adoptive custody. We have a, a large number of kids that were adopted that um, are in the CBAY program. Um, most of the, over 80% of those kids that are that we serve, uh, well, I think CBAY serves in general, and it may be closer to 90% came out of a PRTF. Um, we've had kids, and in, in our rate of return to the PRTF once they come into our program is less than 5%. I think it, our for MAC specifically, we have a 3% return to PRTFs once they come into our CBAY program. Oh, sorry, I'm supposed to hurry. <laughs> um, so they have a 3%. So, um, so when you think about that, it shows that having a community-based approach and a flexible um, approach really can help um, kids stay in the community. And we have, I have really worked very hard, me personally, not Mac, has worked very hard to try to get the private providers that serve child welfare kids to engage in being these extra service providers for CBAY so that they can really, it's a great opportunity for them to reach out and be more community-based. Um, I, I say all these, these things around the private providers because um, they're really struggling kind of moving into this new community base. I think someone else had talked about my, the PRTF doesn't want the kid to move and that sort of thing. And, um, and I think a lot of that comes from kind of where they come from. Um, I think it's not ill-intentioned or anything like that. I think it's, it's not, I don't think it's about money, at least the PRTFs I work with, they don't try to keep their beds filled for money or anything like that. It really is about, that's what they know, the kid, they, kids have to do well. Um, but Diane and the, pro, the um, Office of Provider Management has done a really excellent job in the last year really moving providers into more community-based services and to really support providers in being more focused on permanency. And so Diane's going to talk to you a little bit more about um, the performance-based contract and what that means because as anybody, if you're, you'll be able to see, and she'll talk a little bit more about that, about how, um, how providers are being rated and what that means. Um, okay, the good news is, I agree with everything you have said, <laughs> and um, she's a wonderful, excellent partner, so I'm going to be very brief. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our performance-based uh, contracting, um, but I want to start out with a quick question for you guys. Did anybody eat out either this morning or this afternoon? Okay, did you notice what the uh, rating was for the restaurant, the health rating? Okay, did anybody else recently notice a health rating? What, what did you see? You, it's got to be over 90? Yeah, it has to be over 90 or I will not eat there at all. That's really high. <laughs> I was excited. I went to the outdoor therapy program about a week ago, and their rating was 100 in the kitchen. It was Excellent. 100. Excellent. Okay, so can we all agree whether or not you have a, a recent memory about a rating or not? that when you go into a restaurant and you see the grade, you see a 100A or you see an ADB, it immediately communicates to you something about that restaurant, right? You don't have to know <coughs> the, the ins and outs of when the uh, health inspector, how often they come out or what's the rating form that they use. You have some confidence in the fact that that score and that grade is communicating something to you. And you can make an immediate decision about whether or not you want to eat there or not? Well, that is basically what we are creating with our um, CCIs. We are creating a system where every quarter we will give that provider a score and a grade that you can immediately see um, how they're performing for that previous quarter. And that information is going to be used by our defects case managers, and it should be also used by you as well as you're going out and looking into your, your children's uh, well-being. But the uh, placement workers will be able to say, okay, I've got three CCIs that I can place my child with. One has a, a, a 92A, one has a 78C, and one has a, a 80B. 
Which one am I going to use? Well, obviously, they're going to want to use the one with the higher score. Um, just very quickly, I wanted to point out that what I'm talking about are the CCIs, which are child caring institutions. Uh, we have 171 sites across the state of Georgia. Um, and between the CCIs and the child placing agencies, which are our private foster care um, agencies, um, they have placement of about 40% of our DFACS youth. Most of the presentations uh, so far have focused in on the PRTFs. Um, and as Heather said, these are not placements, these are hospitals. Um, there are seven of them. They're not managed by my unit, um, so I can't speak to how they're managed or what their rating systems are. Um, and less than 1% of our kids in defects custody are actually placed in the PRTFs. So I'm only talking about the um, CCIs. Um, you probably can't see that very well, but I think you have handouts. But in the Office of Provider Management, of which I'm the director, we're responsible for going out and monitoring the CCIs and the CPAs um, to as I said, to come up with those ratings um, that we'll begin doing um, in fiscal year 2013. We look at their records, we interview kids, we interview staff, um, we go out on an annual basis to do a complete comprehensive review, and we also go out randomly unannounced to do safety reviews. So we'll pop up in a CCI or we'll pop up in a CPA's uh, foster home, um, and we'll just check and see, you know, how are the kids <coughs> doing right now, today. Um, also in my unit, we do CPS screenings for um, the foster, the CPA foster homes. So they can't do their own CPS screenings to check their uh, family's history, so we do that. And we also have the special investigations uh, unit um, that reports to me as well. Just for informational purposes, I wanted to give you kind of a snapshot of um, the 171 child caring institutions that we have. Um, here's just a quick breakdown of where they're located, North, Metro, and South, and then the sizes of them. The majority of our CCIs are small mom and pop operations of six beds or fewer. So they're not the big conglomerates. Um, they're really very small um, agencies um, in communities. Um, very few of them are large or extra large. Um, for the child placing agencies, which will be your private agency foster homes, um, they're kind of more spread out as far as their sizes. Um, medium agencies, they'll have seven to about 20 foster homes that they're managing. Okay, so very quickly, performance-based contracting, basically it's pay for performance. We're paying for outcomes. Um, and it's um, basically to keep providers accountable and then also to equip us with information when we're trying to make um, placement matching decisions. The tricky thing here in Georgia, as far as performance-based contracting, is we're not a privatized state. And so DFACS retains the responsibility for being the case manager of the children and for um, being responsible for ensuring that permanency is achieved. So in states where you have a privatized system, it's a lot easier to write a performance-based goal because the provider is completely responsible for everything. Uh, with our performance-based outcomes, we had to very uh, carefully craft goals that providers could be held accountable for. Because I can't hold a provider accountable for something that um, is impacted by whether or not a defects worker did something. Because then it's difficult to say, well, you earned an A, because maybe that A was really earned by defects, or maybe you got a D, but it was because defects failed to do something um, on their end. So with performance-based contracting, we're hoping that we'll have um, more informed placement um, selections, we'll have better matching expectations, we'll have better outcomes for children. Um, for the providers, certainly those who get A's and B's, they're going to be getting the one, they're the ones that are going to be getting the referrals. Um, so it's going to definitely have an um, incentive, a financial incentive for them um, to do well. Um, and we're hoping that we're going to get um, more um, more creative ways of um, providers meeting their service outcomes or their service expectations. Some of the things that um, Heather talked about, they really do need to kind of branch out and feel supported in being able to branch out and to do some different things. What's the process? Well, as I talked about, my, my team goes out statewide and we do um, look at their performance. Um, the goals are broken down into safety, permanency, and well-being outcomes. Again, all within the scope of a, what a provider can actually do. Um, we score them quarterly, and then we will provide those scores to the DFACS uh, case managers. 
um, for the general public, you'll be a, a, able to see what someone's overall score is, but the DFACS workers will be able to see their entire scorecard and, and kind of look at the details of how that score uh, was derived for that particular provider. Just so as I said, they'll get a score from A to F, just like um, in grade school, so it will quickly communicate to a, a worker or to someone in the public, if you're looking at their overall score, um, just how well they did during that quarter. Uh, we've been doing this for the last two years, but it's been a hold harmless um, testing cycle, and so we have not publicized anything because we wanted to make sure that everybody was, um, the providers were comfortable with what was going on and we were comfortable and we were all just, you know, trying to learn and try to figure out what are the best goals to hold them accountable to. Um, and so our end of Hold Harmless is June 30th and July 1 is when we start our first year of accountability. So the first quarterly report, um, the first quarter will end September the 30th of this year. And so the first scores will be published probably around uh, the beginning of November. So in answer to the question that was on the agenda about, you know, what can you do um, as far as going forward with, with your caseloads and the children that you serve, ask the providers and ask the staff um, starting in November, what's the score? What's, what's your performance-based um, contracting score? Um, and if they're a CCI or a CPA, they will definitely have one. Um, as far as how the scoring is based, um, depending on whether or not you're a CCI or a CPA, that's where the little range comes in at. Um, the OPM safety reviews and foster home study reviews, because we do a qualitative review of the foster home studies. I know someone was asking about um, multiple placements. Um, sometimes there's multiple placements because we don't have um, good families that have been approved, or we don't have families that have been approved that, that are willing to uh, work with children who have the, the, the great needs that some of our kids have. Um, and so we're doing some qualitative reviews of the foster home studies that the um, CPAs have um, approved. And that's 15 to 20 percent of the score. Um, we also have the annual comprehensive reviews that takes uh, up 25 percent of the score. And then the provider self-reported measures on safety, permanency, and well-being take up the other 55 to 60 percent. Even though those are self-reported measures, we go out and we verify the information. Um, and so there's penalties for not being truthful, um, but hopefully we won't have any kind of issues like that. So that's a quick and dirty um, look at performance-based contracting. Does anyone have any questions? Right. Well, thank you. Does anyone have any questions overall for our panel? We have a few minutes left. And so I didn't, although we did, we did take it in component parts, um, if there were any lingering questions you had or unresolved issues or uh, requests for information or help that you had, now would be the time. You can just stay. He's not recording. Oh, are we going to do? Rec no, he's recording. Um, I just wanted to, uh, probably Diane might be the best one. I don't know if this is included, or any of you, but um, I think somebody talked about it earlier. Um, the issue with the behavior, being able to leave campus without, is, uh, without behavior being um, a decision maker and whether they can go out for the weekend. Kind of stuff. Is that part of the con uh, contracting based performance? Because I see that a lot and we just see a little sliver in the cold case project, but uh, we see that kind of a consistent thing. It's a culture thing. Well, it's not an issue in the um, CCIs. Okay, it probably is an issue in the PRTFs. Um, so. I don't have anything other than I agree with you <laughs> that it's a problem. We see it, um, and and we see it, and we do actually see it in CCIs also. Um, really, in any setting where a kid is, we run into um, that. It is a culture issue, I think, yeah. where staff just think that there needs to be a consequence. Yeah, and it's the holding on. I mean, we talked about this before, but there was actually a child who was going to go somewhere for New Year's Eve, and there was a punishment for that child that she couldn't go. And I, it was kind of like somebody said, the, someone talked about the holidays, and it's such a severe punishment. It's also an opportunity to be socialized for permanency, to get to be in a group, a church, and all that kind of stuff. And 
it seemed too strong. I know her behavior was probably rough, but it seems too strong, and nobody seemed to have a problem with it when we were having this conversation. And the other one that I, was, I still worry about is a culture thing, and I didn't know if performance-based contracting would address it, and I know it's maybe not the right place, was the, the call for law enforcement. And I had a long conversation with two providers in this state, and they were saying, what else are we supposed to do? When a child is another child, they need to be held accountable. Agreed. But that call to the police begins this record, and that record it hurts them long term. And we just had another foster kid who applied to college, and he had to write down his college application, which may be true everywhere, if he had ever been arrested. And it didn't say juvenile, it didn't say anything. He had to write down if he'd been arrested. He had been arrested because he was a foster kid. And so, and he had gotten invites, and the people had called. And I just worry about that. And if he gets, if he has to put down a college application, will he get into college and that kind of stuff? Stop there. Well, we have, um, we have a set of uh, standards for our CCIs and our CPAs. And if you go to the um, Georgia SCORE website, which is www.gascore.com, gascore.com, um, you will find a set of uh, standards for our room board and watchful oversight providers. I'm going to be posting the FY13 standards um, on Monday. So right now it's the FY12. But we wrote in a standard that basically um, encouraged providers to make better decisions regarding the use of law enforcement. We also track that um, it's a significant event when you call law enforcement and you have to report that to us. So we're tracking it. We're, we have written a standard regarding it. We had a practice matters meeting, what used to be called G meetings. We had a practice matters meeting specifically focused on the use of law enforcement. Um, we cannot legally tell them that they have to um, not call the police if they want to make a complaint because that's their right as a citizen to do that. They cannot, we can't tell them that you're, you have to tell your staff never to press charges. And so we've done everything that we can to encourage them to use better decision making as far as that's concerned. The other issue about visitation as far as CCIs are concerned, from my perspective, the defects case manager is the lead person on the case. And so they need to make a decision about whether or not a visit is going to happen or is not going to happen. Again, in our standards, it says that you cannot use um, visitation as a punishment. You know, if a kid is supposed to see their family or their sibling or somewhat something, we, we can't use whatever went on in the house to make that visit not happen. So that's a standard, plus the defects case manager needs to manage the case. And if you have problems where people are not um, abiding either by the standards or not standing up as the case manager, then that's where folks like me and Ursula come in. And you can email us, call us, and we can advocate um, from our end. What kind of training do the service providers get? You know, so they, like you were talking about, you know, these new ways to deal with children to avoid calling the police and stuff. I mean, as part of them maintaining their status as service providers, are they required to take, you know, ongoing training? Like we take CL, you know, I mean, stay well, on top of stuff. Their um, staff are required to get uh, 24 hours of <coughs> annual ongoing training. When they come on board to be a provider, they're required to um, have a director who has particular qualifications. They're required to have a set of standards that, I'm sorry, policies that meet our standards. But there's not a certification process where we say, okay, well, you've given us these standards, and, and yes, your director has the appropriate degree, but do you really know what you're doing? There's not anything for that. The only way that we're going to be able to weed out poor performance is probably through our performance-based contracting. And if people are consistently failing um, our standard threshold, which is a 70% grade, so 70% is kind of like at the line. So if you're consistently falling behind that, below that, then we'll start to be able to take some action and get rid of some of these providers who really are not doing a good job. And within that performance, evaluation is there one of the things you're going to be looking at is there compliance with the staff training requirements that's already being um, very closely monitored by the office of regulatory child care um, they're quite beast about the rules and the regs and so they're already on it and it's also a part of our performance-based contracting measures uh, i had two basic questions kind of background information um, are all foster homes under the child placing agencies as in they're regulated by CPAs, none of them by defects. 
No, we have about mm, probably 3,000, 3, maybe 3,500 um, DFACS foster homes, and then there's probably almost the same amount of foster homes that are managed by CPAs. Okay, all right. And are the foster homes rated? Um, for the CPA foster homes, their performance-based contracting score is derived somewhat from the work that their foster parents are doing. For instance, we have a, a placement stability measure. Um, and so if you have a foster parent who's constantly ejecting kids, then that's going to impact your PBC score because your uh, placement stability rating is going to be low. Um, so um, it is a factor, the quality of their homes and the training of their homes. Correct. No. They don't have a contract. They're they're part of the, the state system. I know I get that question all the time. Um, their the responsibility for ensuring the quality of defects foster homes falls within that county, that regional structure, and the state structure. So you have a county director, you've got a regional director, and then you've got the state office, and that group of people is responsible for the services of what goes on in that county, including the foster homes. Is there any tracking of some? some of the foster homes that you know might go through 30 children that have been there for a few days at a time is there any any kind of tracking of that yes okay. there is there is through um through my office um there is an expectation that the cpas are tracking that um and and they are closing homes that um are consistently you know just you know having a kid placed there for a couple of days and then they're like oh no i can't do this so th it, it is something that we're working on um, but I, I guess you have to also keep in mind that there's a finite group of people in the state of Georgia who are willing to be foster parents. Um, and not to say that we just take all comers, but you do have to kind of work with families to see, okay, if these type placements didn't work for you, are you, you know, useful in other areas? Could you do respite? Could you maybe take a younger child? That kind of thing. Well, in closing, I'd just like to thank all of our panelists, our presenters, our visiting scholars in practice, all of you, um, for joining us today. I hope that you all took away a lot of valuable information from this presentation. I look forward to seeing you again for the next topic, hopefully next month. Stay tuned for that, and I hope you'll please join me in, again, thanking all of our guests.